so welcome to today's lecture, Ant 200, Introduction to Archaeology. Today, we are going to continue our conversation about the food revolution by looking at the history of alcohol in the kind of big picture. So we'll start with its origins in Neolithic China, set sail across the Mediterranean, and drink mead in the halls of medieval kings in Europe. As you follow along in this lecture, consider some of the similarities and differences and the way that alcohol is perceived and used in different cultures throughout history. So let's start with the kind of big ideas behind the production of alcohol. Basically, what is the chemistry behind this elixir? So even though there are kind of archeological bits of evidence that people were drinking alcohol roughly 10,000 years ago, the word itself, alcohol, is only about a thousand years old and had nothing to do with the drinking of an intoxicating liquid. The word alcohol, just like algebra and algorithm and alchemy and almanac, comes from the Arabic language. The term was coined by the Persian physician and philosopher Muhammad ibn Zakaria al-Razi in the late 9th century AD, after he successfully isolated the compound. During this time, alcohol referred to a fine black powder that was created during the distillation process. This powder was used for cosmetics and medical purposes. In terms of the science behind alcohol, most people who have had a couple of alcoholic drinks could tell you about this substance's basic effects, mild euphoria, increased sociability, a decrease in anxiety, and perhaps an ill-placed confidence in one's singing or dancing abilities. Suffice it to say, karaoke bars have made a lot of money from alcohol's effects on the human brain. The more you drink, however, the more the negative effects come into play, impaired motor and memory function, a depressed nervous system, and overall stupor or intoxication, what we call drunkenness. While we may be familiar with the effects of drinking alcohol, the chemistry behind the active ingredient in beer, wine, and liquor is a bit more complex. Alcohol is actually a fairly broad term, encompassing a number of different types of organic compounds, that is, compounds centered around the element carbon. In science speak, one would say that it's an organic compound where a hydrogen and oxygen compound is linked to a carbon atom saturated with hydrogen atoms. On a molecular level, when, you, when you're having a glass of wine, you might very well think of it as drinking a bunch of little ball and stick compounds like this one behind me. All drinkable alcohol is actually a version of this broader category of compounds known as ethanol. Ethanol is represented by the chemical formula C2H5OH, basically two carbon atoms attached to five hydrogen atoms and one hydrogen oxygen compound. In its pure state, ethanol is clear and flammable with just a slight smell. Ethanol is produced through the process of fermentation, a process where the sugar compounds are broken down anaerobically by yeast and bacteria changing from a single sugar molecule to two ethanol molecules and two carbon dioxide molecules. So that's the basic process. Find something with sugar and yeast and watch the sugar turn into ethanol. But how does this ethanol compound actually make you think you're a better dancer or more likely to approach that guy or girl at the end of the bar? Once in the bloodstream, ethanol compounds bind to two different types of receptors in the brain one that inhibits behavior and one that deals with alertness and memory. Once these are blocked, you feel both more relaxed and sociable, but eventually more tired and forgetful. If you're wondering why you're busting out such awesome dance moves if alcohol is a depressant, it's because alcohol also has stimulant qualities. It releases non-reparephrine, adrenaline, and cortisol, all of which hype you up. And on top of this, it also causes the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine, which is why we feel like we're having such a good time when we're out with friends having a couple of drinks. 
Eventually, once the alcohol crosses the blood-brain barrier, it starts negatively impacting our basic functions. This is why stumbling home from the bar becomes an actual thing. So to summarize, alcohol does what it does because it blocks some receptors, those that inhibit behavior and make you alert, and it releases other chemicals like adrenaline and dopamine. So next time you consider busting out an awesome dance move at the bar, consider whether you really want to do this or whether it's simply the non referendum talking. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about the science behind alcohol, let's talk about some of the earliest evidence of alcohol consumption in human history. When we think about the geography of wine in the modern world, we tend to think of places like Bordeaux in France or Tuscany in Italy, regions in Europe justifiably famous for their high quality wine production. But the origins of wine production are actually nowhere near the old heart of the Roman Empire. Instead, we need to travel east to China, where a team of archaeologists discovered the earliest evidence for wine at the site of Jiahao in 1995. Settlement at Jiahao dates back to about 7000 BC. At the site, we have evidence for ceramic vessels that contained a variety of alcoholic beverages, rice wine, mead, and most importantly for us, grape wine. In addition to chemical residues of alcoholic beverages, Archaeologists also identified grape pits themselves. These pits indicate this earliest version of wine was more like a cocktail mixed with honey and tree resin to improve flavor and preservation. Our earliest evidence for actual straight up grape only wine comes from within the modern boundaries of the Eastern European country of Georgia. Archaeologists here found evidence for wine that comes from chemical analyses of ceramic vessels. And here we think that the wine was drank straight and unmixed, much like our wine today. The vessels used for this analysis are also of interest. They're massive and bulky and oddly can't stand upright. They were likely either put on a stand or buried in the ground. And the same vessel, due to its size and weight, something near about 300 liters, was likely used for fermentation, storage, and serving of the wine. Well, maybe Italy's at, at least got the oldest wine production facility remains, right? Well, that's actually a no. The honor of the world's oldest winery belongs to Armenia in a cave known as Arena One because it's near the modern town of Aranai. An entire wine production facility was found dating back to 4100 BC. That's over 6,000 years ago. That wine production facility contained everything you need to make and enjoy wine. A wine press, jars for the fermentation process, serving vessels, and drinking cups. The spread of sophisticated technologies like bronze weapons coincides with increasing socioeconomic stratification and the spread of alcohol across Europe, the Near East, Africa, and Asia. For instance, chemical evidence of beer drawn from the archaeological remains of ceramic vessels dates back over 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. These remains are corroborated by early forms of writing on clay tablets and seals. For instance, this Sumerian cylinder seal depicts people drinking a beverage, presumably beer, through straws. While it's pretty uncommon to consume alcohol using straws today, in the ancient Near East, these straws were actually really important because the beer was unfiltered. Barley holes and other de debris would have gathered on the liquid surface. So the straws would have been helpful for drinkers to bypass all that mess and get to the actual alcohol. The historical record indicates that beer was important enough to Sumerian society that it transcended the mortal realm to that of the gods. The goddess Inkasi, the Sumerian patron goddess of brewing, had a hymn dedicated to her, which in addition to glorifying the goddess actually described the brewing process. In its written form, this hymn dates to about 1800 BC, making it the oldest written record of a beer recipe. We also have economic evidence in the form of receipts for beer. These receipts aren't the same type you get at a store today. Instead, they're actually more like payslips. 
Workers were often paid in beer, and here we can see examples of the receipts that were given for the beer rations they received in exchange for their labor. The link between work and beer was prevalent in ancient Egypt as well. Because coinage had yet to be invented, workers were often paid in bread and beer. And we have evidence for this occurring for the workers of the Giza pyramids and many other instances beyond. The basic wage would have been about 10 loaves of bread and one full, fairly large jug of beer per day. Once the beer was brought home, it was drunk by men, women, and children, suggesting that the alcohol content would have been lower than most beers today, probably something more around three and 4%. Beer in festivals or for funerals, however, could have been much stronger. Our evidence for brewing in the Middle Kingdom in Egypt is especially strong because of the numerous wooden models that show people engaged in the brewing process. These models were found in the tombs of ancient Egyptian pharaohs as part of the elaborate funerary recreations of daily life. Although not intended for archeologists, the high level of accuracy in these dioramas gives scholars a pretty good idea of how beer was actually produced in Egypt. Back in the Mediterranean, wine rather than beer was always the alcoholic drink of choice. And that's certainly true of ancient Greece. Archaeological evidence suggests that wine was first made in Greece in the late Neolithic and became a pretty big deal in the early Bronze Age. This development would have happened right around 3000 BC, the same time that beer was becoming a big thing in Egypt and the Near East. Based on the distribution of vessels for storing and producing wine, we think that winemaking first began on the Greek islands and then eventually spread to the mainland. But the spread of wine didn't stop at Greece's borders. One of the most important aspects of early Greek culture is that it didn't just stay in Greece. Starting in the eighth century BC, Greek city-states set out on expeditions to found colonies throughout the Mediterranean. Southern Italy and Sicily became swamped with so many Greek colonies that they started calling it Magna Grecia, Greater Greece. And colonies continued along the French Riviera, the Spanish coast, and even up into the Black Sea. And what do you think these colonists were drinking as they set up shop all over the Mediterranean? That's right, wine. So Greek colonization isn't just about politics or economics. It's also integral to the spread of wine throughout the Mediterranean. Now, wine was a pretty big part of Greek society. Greek wine started out a little stronger than our wine today but they mix the wine with water in order to reduce the alcohol content. Wine could, wine could then be drunk at meals throughout the day. It also played a big role in religion, becoming part of rituals to gods like Dionysus, the god of wine, and part of sacrifices intended to either thank the gods or coax something out of them. Wine was also the center of many social interactions, most famously the symposium. Symposia were all male aristocratic drinking parties held in the house of one wealthy participant. At these parties, men would go into the anderon, literally the man's room, and lay on couches like these here, sipping wine, eating snacks, and discussing politics or philosophy. Over the course of the evening, as more and more wine was drunk, these parties would become more raucous. Female courtesans would often be brought in for musical and sexual entertainment. And the ancient Greeks even had their own drinking game, katabos, where they'd fling the dregs of their wine at a target in the middle of the room. And at the end of the night, the party would often spill out onto the streets, much like happens here in Toronto when the bars close down. The convivium, is one of these kind of uh, important parts, important kind of drinking parties that happen in the Roman world. This enlarged westward across the Adriatic to the Italian peninsula, the Romans had their own type of party called the convivium. In larger part, this was pretty similar to the symposium where there was a bunch of rich older men sitting around yammering on and getting drunk on wine. In other ways, though, the convivium really differed. The 
the convivium was as much about food as it was about drinking. And elite women and children and even lower class clients of the host could often be found in attendance. Just like the Greeks, the Romans also mixed their wine with water, diluting it to reduce the alcohol content in order to help keep the party going. Perhaps surprisingly, they were also they also added a bunch of other stuff to their wine. Similar to early Chinese vintners, Romans often added honey to the wine just before drinking it, creating a version of the wine called mulsum. Other times they boil the wine and add spices, sort of like today's mold wine. And just like today, there were different vintages and varietals of various qualities. The opium vintage of Falerian, dating to about 121 BC, was generally considered the greatest single year and type of wine in the ancient Roman world. And if wine was common in Greece, it was completely ubiquitous in Rome. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner wine would have been served. In, in total, it's estimated that each Roman would have drank about one liter of wine per day. Just for comparison, an entire modern bottle of wine is only three quarters of that size. And if you weren't cooking at home, which was pretty common considering that many lower class houses actually didn't have formal kitchens, then there were plenty of bars to go to. These bars faced out onto the street and were frequent stops for the lower classes, not only because they often served hot food along with wine, but also because they had plenty of gambling and prostitutes. As Christianity spread out of Jerusalem and across Europe during the first millennia AD, the classical culture of ancient Greece and Rome began to decline. While the focus of spirituality and ritual in the Roman Empire started to shift from paganism to monotheism, wine remained a socially important facet of everyday life. As depicted in the famous painting of Jesus's Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci, wine played an important role in Christian religious life. This is perhaps best captured in the tradition of the Eucharist, aka communion, where believers would drink wine which symbolized the blood of Christ. Wine is also commonly referenced in the Bible. For instance, the New Testament documents a miracle in which Jesus transforms water into wine. That's all to say that wine remained a big deal well into the Byzantine Empire, the successor empire to Rome in the East. The Byzantine Empire was officially formed after Constantine the Great moved the capital of Rome to the old town of Byzantium and renamed it Constantinople. Under Emperor Constantine, Rome became less about classical culture and more about Christianity, which is one of the defining characteristics of the Byzantine Empire. With wine being such a big part of Christian religion, wine making continued to flourish in the Byzantine Empire. In fact, the city of Constantinople itself became known as the city of wine, and wine from the region became exported far and wide. Just like in the Byzantine Empire in the East, most of the Western world under the leadership of the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne was focused on Christianity. During the Middle Ages in Europe, monks became the leaders of the winemaking industry. As a quick note, the Middle Ages, also known as the medieval period, is a term coined by early European historians who viewed this roughly 500 year period as kind of backwards, uncivilized, and a dark time compared to the glory of the previous Roman Empire, as well as the Renaissance, which was referred to as the kind of rebirth of this classical culture. While most wine was produced on a small scale during the medieval period, there wasn't much export across Europe at this time. When it was traded, it was usually monk made. In fact, Vinium Theologium or theological wine became known as superior to most other productions. Monk made wine became such a central facet of the region's social religious life that by the 10th and 11th centuries, the stereotype of the wine drunk monk was alive and well. Monks in Western Europe were also heavily involved in the beer brewing industry. Making beer was a great way to purify water and provide essential nutrients that were often difficult to get during tough economic times. <clears throat> 
The, was, the Wine Stefan Brewery in Bavaria started out as an abbey and has been brewing beer since 1040 AD. And just down the road, Waltenburg Abbey started brewing beer all the way back in 1050 AD. Both are still brewing beer today and are possible to visit if you head to Southwestern Germany. This process of brewing continues to modern day, not just in Germany, but also in places like Belgium, where Trappist monks produce what are consistently ranked as some of the world's best beers. Medieval Europe also saw the rise of mead, especially in the royal halls of Northern Europe. Although mead might conjure the image of a thick froth, frothy beer, it was actually much closer to wine. In fact, mead was a version of wine where honey was added much earlier in the brewing process. The Middle Ages were also when, dis when the distillation process uh, be really began to be invented. Scholars believe this happened first in China and then spread west to the Middle East and eventually Europe. With distillation, you basically boil an impure mixture that had some alcohol in it. As the liquid turns to vapor, the non-alcoholic parts in large part are removed. The alcoholic vapor then passes through a cold tube which turns it back into liquid. And the resulting liquid is much purer and higher in alcohol content than whatever started out. Stills, the machinery in which distillation occurred, date back to around the 12th century AD and can be found in both China and Italy. Throughout all this time, the general attitude towards alcohol was pretty consistent and accepting. While drunkenness was socially frowned upon, alcohol was generally considered to be a gift of the gods and it was meant to be consumed and enjoyed. And this perspective, which had really been more or less the same since ancient Rome, absolutely continued into the Renaissance and early modern period. During the 17th and 18th century, the types and quality of wine being produced became increasingly sophisticated. French champagne was invented by the French monk and wine master, Dom Perignon, in the later part of the 17th century. Although he had to deal fairly frequently with the problem of exploding wine bottles. By the 1700s, the red wines of the famous French wine growing regions began to produce vintages that became world renowned and some of which are still around today. This French wine known as Claret came from chateaus that still produce wine today. The 1787 vintage of Chateau Lafitte is legendary a single bottle sold for well over $100,000 back in 1985. And the Chateau Margaux once sold wine by the case to Thomas Jefferson. One bottle of their wine is valued at $500,000. And in we will we'll, um, talk more about alcohol production in Latin America as we move forward in the course. But it's worth noting now that archaeologists don't currently have any evidence that native peoples living in what is now the US and Canada produced alcoholic beverages. With European colonization during the 16th century came a whole series of sweeping demographic and cultural changes, including the production of wine for communion. During the 19th century, beer became particularly common, with most of the breweries in America making somewhat bitter English-style ale. Eventually, as more German immigrants entered the country, brewers began to shift towards lagers and pilsners. These, these types of Czech-style based hop beers helped the beer preserve longer, and soon these lagers we're most familiar with today came to dominate the market. Eberhard Anheuser, uh, bought a struggling brewery in the mid-19th century, and when his daughter married Adolphus Busch, Anheuser-Busch and Budweiser beer was created. Alcohol of all sorts began to struggle during the 19th century, as the rise of factories and nine-to-five jobs made standard schedules important. All of a sudden, you couldn't just show up whenever to work. Attitudes began to change from Ben Franklin's famous beer as proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy to something more along the lines of alcohol is the devil and destroys the working class family. 
This, of course, culminated in the 18th Amendment in the United States on Prohibition, passed on January 16, 1919, which banned the production, distribution, and consumption of alcohol. This was a major blow to many alcohol manufacturers, although some found their way around it. Wineries, for example, often started producing wine for church use, and breweries often turned towards making soda or root beer. When prohibition was repealed with the 21st Amendment in 1933, alcohol sales took off once again. To give you a sense of just how much beer was actually being produced after prohibition, here's some numbers. Way back in 1938, shortly after prohibition, Anheuser-Busch was producing about 2 million barrels of beer each year. Each barrel is about 31 gallons, and each gallon has 128 ounces. When we do the math, that comes out to the equivalent of 650 million bottles of beer per year. By the year 2000, Anheuser-Busch was producing 100 million barrels of beer per year, which means that they were producing the equivalent of around 32 billion bottles of beer. Now, it wasn't all bottled. That includes kegs uh, and things that are sent to bars, but still, that's a lot of beer. Beer consumption, at least historically, it peaked around 1980, when the average American was drinking 23 gallons or 250 bottles of beer per year. And remember, that's the average, not including people who drink and people who don't. Since the 1970s, smaller craft breweries have begun to change the early, uh, challenge these early American heavy hitters like Anheuser-Busch. The first craft brewery was created in 1976 out in California by an optical engineer. Two years later, there were, more, there were about 40 craft breweries in the US alone. By 2012, however, the number had jumped to over 2,000. The craft brewery craze has spread throughout the globe with over 9,000 microbreweries now in operation. North America continues to dominate this market with over 1,200 breweries in Canada and about 3,800 in the US. The US wine industry centered on the California valleys of Napa and Sonoma also took off ever since Napa Valley's Chateau Montalina defeated the wineries of France in a blind taste test in 1976. This contest was known as the Judgment of Paris with references to Trojan Prince Paris choosing Aphrodite, the goddess of love, as the best of the goddess, and thus causing the whole Trojan War. Wine production has been growing ever since the 1970s, and in 2016, the state of California alone produced over 3 billion bottles of wine. That's all to say that alcohol today seems to be going strong. Beer and wine are still part of fancy parties, just like they were at the Symposia in ancient Greece and the Convivia in ancient Rome. Wine is also a big part of religious rituals. We have communion in churches today in the same way that wine would have been used during religious festivals in Greece and Rome. And alcohol is certainly a huge part of daily life in both the ancient and modern worlds. And while we may not drink an entire liter per day, it seems safe to conclude that with billions of bottles of beer and wine made each year, that alcohol today is just as important in our culture as it was in theirs.